President Oaks, I think when I received the assignment to come here, I had still visions of College Hall. <laughs> I don't know that I've been to an assembly at the Brigham Young University since. It's quite overpowering. I don't know whether I should say this or not in view of the black and white brigade over here. <laughs> but in our experience with missionaries, we had the custom of assigning those who new arrived newly in the field to speak at a street meeting on the evening of their first day in the mission field. <laughs> their usual reaction was to shudder under the feeling that the most fearsome thing that could happen to them while they were on their mission was about to happen. My feelings tonight are quite similar. Of all the things I've watched general authorities do, this matter of standing to speak in public before 10,000 people has loomed as one of the most awesome and frightening. I'm sustained with the thought that within 30 or 40 minutes from now, whatever it is that's going to take place here will already have happened. Before we came in, Brother President Brown mentioned that uh, the Lord bless me, and I told him I felt how much I needed it. But it did remind me of a day when, we, when I was yet in the Aaronic Priesthood at a special gathering of this group in our stake. I remember one of the groups stood up and sang a song about their bishop. I believe his name was Bishop Diamond, and they said, Here is Bishop Diamond. He's with us tonight. He's with us. God bless him. God bless him. He needs it. <laughs> As Brother Cahoon mentioned, the 7th of September, my thoughts came back to the feeling, whenever this day rolls around, that all of us who are old enough reflect back on what we were doing when the news burst upon us of the attack of, on Pearl Harbor in 1941. That day, the lights began to go out in our country. It was a terrible feeling. The lights had al already largely gone out throughout Europe, and subsequently we all passed through a period of terrible travail before the lights came back on again. We used to sing a song in those days, When the Lights Come On Again All Over the World. Today my generation can give some hope to yours, if you ever need it, when you are troubled by the dark and gloomy prospects that sometimes appear in our future. The preceding generation has given us these same feelings that there really is light ahead. This can and ought to be an optimistic world. Now the spirit season is a time of light. For us who live in this hemisphere, it's the it, weather-wise, it's the darkest time of all the year. But this is never apparent when Christmas time rolls around. Since this is your last fireside before the Christmas vacation, I'm sure Together with the great music that we've already participated in, we can usher in this Christmas season tonight. Now the spirit begins to soar as the soul awakens to festivity. At the BYU, classes begin to lose their interest. Other thoughts start to come into focus going home to the family, to your friends and your loved ones, engagement rings and other things. <laughs> Tradition and custom have built Christmas into a wonderful experience, and it's a great time to remember. To children throughout the world, it's a time for Santa Claus. To the followers of Christ, it's the celebration of His birth. 
This celebration really ought to be the greatest festival of the year, <clears throat> for we are told that there is none other name under heaven given whereby we must be saved. And herein we remember the central figure of the entire universe, the promised Savior and the Redeemer. We have been taught to say in the Church that faith is the first principle of the gospel. Then we are reminded that faith is the moving cause of all action. And often we are referred to the farmer who plants his crops motivated by faith, and so on. Let me now state that faith is not the first principle of the gospel. The first principle of the gospel is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there is a great difference. Any unbelieving farmer can plant in faith, but to believe in Jesus Christ is something else. There has been no witnessed or authenticated event in all history that can compare with the coming to the earth of Jesus Christ. It is good for university students who engross themselves in gathering facts to remember this point. He spoke as our God by way of prophecy about the nature of His coming. To Samuel the Lamanite He gave the prediction of heavenly manifestation. And then to Nephi, who was the contemporary of the Savior as a prophet here in America, He said, Lift up your head and be of good cheer. For behold, the time is at hand, and on this night shall the sign be given and on the morrow come I into the world. You really can't have a Christmas without referring to that soul-lifting story as recorded in St. Luke. And so it was that while they were there the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And, lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Have you ever listened to that story in a sacred setting without feeling the spiritual assurance that this event actually took place. This heavenly influence of which the angels told, we all now feel right here at this moment through the power of the Holy Ghost, which witnesses again to us as it has done for nearly two thousand years <clears throat> that the birth of the Lord is real. Its significance transcends every other event in, history in the history of the world since the creation. In his unsurpassed oratorio, The Messiah, George Friedrich Handel quotes from the divine announcements and the injunctions which surround the hallowed life of Jesus Christ. Of his destiny we sing, for unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, 
and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of his mission, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Of the Atonement, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Of his glorification, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Throughout the years of my life, <clears throat> I have heard how Christ died for us. This concept has always been a little abstract to me. How could I get the feeling of just what he did and how it was accomplished and its significance? The understanding came much better into focus two years ago at a Christmas gathering when one of our dear friends told of his experience during the Second World War. He was serving in the South Pacific when the commander of his unit ordered the following, for the following day a special reconnaissance mission for John's detachment. And John said, I shuddered at the thought of this assignment, for I knew from experience that it would be useless and foolish. There was no, imp no valuable purpose to be attained by it. It would be very dangerous, and I felt almost a certainty that if I went, I, along with others, would be killed. He said, I prayed that night with great earnestness ex explaining to the Lord how I wanted to devote my life to His purposes. He said, I didn't want to lose my life in some useless, fruitless little mission. <clears throat> I wanted to return home safely and fulfill my destiny in the earth, to find my wife and raise a family in the gospel. John said, The Lord heard my prayer. In the morning I was afflicted with a fever. It wasn't, I wasn't very ill, but enough that I was relieved from the mission, and another being sent in my stead. And as he had foreseen, the mission was a disaster, and this man, together with a number of others, were killed. Then, said John, I really began to think, this man gave his life for me. Whenever I rejoice in the blessings of my life, I now remember him. The gifts of my wife, my children, my grandchildren, my whole blessed life on this earth were, brought, were bought for me at the sacrifice of the life of that man who took my place. It was unavoidable, of course, in this case, but nevertheless very real. Of such a nature, even more infinite was the sacrifice of the Savior in our behalf. Were it not for him, the life he lived and the atonement he wrought, we would all be without hope of continued happiness and the blessings of exaltation and would be in a way to suffer grievous penalties and disasters which would make life utterly unbearable. What would this world be like without the Savior? Even the profane man would have an inadequate basis from, from which to launch his oath. What would life be like without Christmas? From infancy, it has been the symbol of our most enthralling moments. In recent times, since we have now the means to project the witness we bear beyond our own society, and especially in our general conferences, we begin to hear more, with more emphasis the statement of the fact that the prophet of this Church is not the prophet merely to the members of the Church, but indeed he is the Lord's prophet to the entire world. To every Latter-day Saint, of course, this is entirely logical, 
For we know that through the restoration of the gospel with the accompanying authority of the holy priesthood, the message of salvation is now made available to all nations, and it's ra as rapidly as we can gain access into them. This again is a fulfillment of numerous prophecies since olden times. The knowledge of these recent works of God among his children enables us to teach again what was fully understood among the original disciples of the Savior. Even though many inhabitants of the world now disclaim that the basic principles of Christianity are valid, there was no such down, doubt in the mind of, minds of Peter and of the early apostles. They knew, and their every word proclaimed, that Jesus was the Redeemer not, not only for the Jews, but for all men on the face of the earth. Recently, Sister Banger and I had the privilege of passing over Mars Hill in Athens, where Paul set forth in clarity the doctrine that all people everywhere come under the plan of God for salvation. As it says in the book of Acts, Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that all things, in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is the Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, for we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God hath winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world by righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whereof he hath given assurance to all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead." Now there is quite a difference in the belief of the gospel and the belief of the world. To make a brief comparison, the gospel teaches us that he lives, that God our Father made us. The world tends to say, we made God. The gospel says he is a literal son of God. The world said he was just a man, perhaps a great one. The gospel says he is resurrected and lives above. The world says he's dead, his resurrection's a myth. The gospel says his words are eternal truth. The world says his excellent teachings have meaning only as they relate to how we want to live. The gospel said, to sin is spiritual death. The world says there's no sin nor spirit. The gospel says love is eternal. The world says love is for convenience. The, world, the gospel says we will be judged on principles of good and evil, and the world says good and evil are relative. There's no devil. Again, the gospel says we will live again. The world says when you're dead, you're dead. God is dead. And the gospel says serve God and your fellow man. And the world says enjoy what comes for your own satisfaction. Now, I suppose that 
It could be assumed that these worldly ideas have just been thought up. No greater fallacy exists. History is loaded with examples of how these same old ideas have been carried on throughout all the ages, and every generation that digs them up thinks, thinks that they've discovered something new that eventually has led all others into, time, into times of destruction. In the Doctrine and Covenants, the first section, we are told that they seek not the Lord to establish his righteousness, but every man walketh in his own way and after the image of his own God, whose image is in the likeness of the world and whose substance is that of an idol. So among the greatest lies that we have heard are these, that there was an evolution of the concept that there is only one God. This is often attributed to Moses. If you go into the background of it, no one who's ever studied a nickel's worth about Moses can ever imagine that he dug up the idea of one God. Moses, when he was called by the voice out of the burning bush, stepped forward, approached that holy place, and he heard the voice, as I think it may be vivid if you recall what you have seen in the movie The Ten Commandments. As he approached the bush, he heard the voice which said, Moses, Moses, put off thy shoes from off thy feet for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. And then as Moses conversed with the Lord and was commanded to go back into Egypt and deliver the children of Israel, he said with every excuse he could think of, finally, but I don't even know your name. When I go back, who shall I say sent me? And the Lord spoke again and said, Say to the children of Israel, I am sent you. I am that I am. If you ever thought deeply of the significance of those words, you realize where the idea came from, that there was one God. As we reviewed in our remembrance this film, The Ten Commandments, much of the fictitious part, of course, showed how after Moses had brought forth the various plagues upon Egypt, the son of Pharaoh was smitten in death, as were the families of all the Egyptians. And in this film, Pharaoh took his young son in his arms and approached his god who stood there as an idol in the form of a great beast. It's still impressive to me how he pled with his god to bring his son back to life. And in spite of all his prayers, his god stood and looked at him as dumb as he was in the beginning. Then Pharaoh's wife, who in the fiction had at one time been in love with Moses, said to her husband, Go out and find these people and kill Moses. And so Pharaoh pursued with his armies and met the destruction that was there and finally returned to his household. And his wife said, Well, what happened? Did you find him? Did you kill him? He said, No, I couldn't kill him. Why couldn't you kill him? He said, Because his God is God. Now that testimony is in the depth of the meaning of I am. Another of the great lies is that chastity is puritanical or Victorian. And all around us we hear excuses made for licentiousness and immorality on the basis that it's just a faded out, worn out old idea. This fallacy is evident to anybody who ever read a book to know that the principles of righteousness, of morality, were embodied in truth long before Jesus Christ came on earth, that he had taught them throughout the ages of the earth to the ancient prophets, and they have always been the way of the Lord. Another that comes to us more frequently now is that perversion 
that we're witnessing in marriage, in the home, and in the family, and the philosophy that these principles have no depth and great meaning. To any true Latter-day Saint who bases his principles on Jesus Christ, there is no question that these are the eternal values that the gospel teaches us. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the narrow way. Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Elder Packer has pointed out that because of this declaration many people in the world have lost faith in the truth. They sh say, surely there must be other ways. This is very restrictive. It wouldn't even be fair. And so various religions and other doctrines have crept in to suppose that God didn't really mean what he said, that mankind might find a way to salvation aside from the name of Jesus Christ, that maybe there are other names and other ways, and they've made adjustments in their faith in spite of all that God himself has said. For all, anyway, <clears throat> for all these reasons, we find ourselves now as the true witnesses of Jesus Christ. We're called to live in the world, but to come spiritually out of the world and to stand as witnesses, as Alma said, of God at all times and in all things and in all places that she may be in even unto death that ye may be redeemed of God. I had an interesting experience two or three years ago as I was assigned down in the West Texas region. The stake president there had a son who played football in high school, and I'd like to tell you that in Texas they take their football seriously. They take Texas seriously, as a matter of fact, and. I learned many things there. Authentically from the stake president, I learned that George Washington was really born in Texas. <laughs> and just briefly to digress, the story was that one morning his father, who had planted a nice pecan orchard, had uh, given George a little hatchet for his birthday present and a little later went out and found that one of the trees was chopped down and he said to George, did you chop down the pecan tree? And George said, Oh, Father, I cannot tell a lie. I chopped it down with my little hatchet. And he said that's when they moved to Virginia because his father said that anybody who can't tell a lie has no business living in Texas. Now, I hope that won't be a reflection on Texas because I recognize it as a truly marvelous place. But as I said, they do take their football seriously. And I happened to attend this game with the state president where his son played. They were in one of the quarterfinal games for the state championship, and they eventually won the state. But I noticed an interesting thing. Uh, before the game, both teams out on the field knelt down and had prayer. You have to understand that Texas in, is in what is sometimes called the Bible Belt. There are many Baptists and disciples of Christ. And it's not uncommon to find towns in Texas that close entirely on Sunday and that bar the sale of liquor, even though they're not Mormon communities. Well, our team won the game, and after the game, I guess the other team didn't have much to pray about. but. Our team again knelt down in the, on the field and had another prayer. And before they prayed, all the high school students in the stands poured out on the field, and they joined the team, and they covered nearly a fourth of the field, and they all joined in that prayer. I thought it was an impressive example. I can't tell you how sincere they were, but I would assume that they meant what they were doing, and they were grateful for their blessings. I would think not that we necessarily would use that means to demonstrate our faith in Christ, but that we ought not to be behind others in our position as true witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Why should we not become the greatest witnesses in all the world of the Lord Jesus Christ? Valiance takes effort and character. Return missionaries who forget and become entrapped in sin have failed to trust. Married people in the Church who refuse to learn and live the gospel of loving one another. And these are very true challenges. They are conditions that surround us increasingly all the time. One night about a year ago in a hotel in Lisbon over in Portugal, I was by myself <clears throat> and found out what it means to suffer the jet lag that you've crossed part of the way around the world, and now when it's time to sleep, you're not sleepy. And so as I went to sleep at 10.30, being tired, I woke up at 11.30 and couldn't go back to sleep. It was a wonderful opportunity for me <clears throat> to do some reading, because usually when I read, it puts me to sleep. <laughs> but I had the experience of reading extensively that night. And I read out of the 11th chapter of 3rd Nephi. The Savior in his visit declared, And this is my doctrine, and it is the doctrine which the Father hath given me, and whoso believeth in me and is baptized, the same shall be saved. And they who shall <coughs> and and they are they who shall inherit the kingdom of God, and whoso believeth not in me and is not baptized shall be damned. And whoso believeth in me and be believeth in the Father also, and unto him will the Father bear record of me, for he will visit him with fire and with the Holy Ghost. As I read those passages, I felt the truth of it by the power of the Holy Ghost, which came to me and bore witness to me that this was truly the doctrine of our Father in heaven and Jesus Christ, his Son. Now you can know the divinity of the divinity of the Savior. No doubt many of you, perhaps most all of you know, you have a promise. We're all, I suppose, aware of the promise in the tenth chapter of the Book of Moroni, in the Book of Mormon, wherein it states that when we shall receive these things which are written in that book, we should ask God in the name of Christ if they be true. And if we ask with a sincere heart and real intent, He will manifest the truth of it to us by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now, the occasion I referred to was not the first time that I have felt the witness and the assuring power of the Holy Ghost about the truth of that great book. But there is a way to read that book so that you get the testimony. I remember Elder McConkie telling of the time when he was presiding over a mission in Australia. He quoted this promise out of Moroni to a gathering that he was instructing, and in the group were two Protestant ministers. And one of the men arose and said, That promise is not true. Brother McConkie said, How do you know it's not true? He said, Because I tried it. I read the book and then I asked. Brother McConkie said, Well, how did you ask? And he said, I said in my prayer, O oh God, if this book be true, please strike me dead. He said, it didn't happen, so obviously it isn't true. So Brother McConkie said, I explained to him as carefully as you can and still be a Christian gentleman about, <laughs> about what it says about the way you should read the book. And this man, of course, hadn't complied. But I'd like to suggest that when you come to the point of needing that testimony, you take the book as a sacred thing. And before you begin to read it, you kneel down then and ask God if he'll guide you in your study and add to you the testimony and witness of the truth of what you read. And then when you put it down, each time kneel again and ask him to assure you and indicate to you if what you've read is true or not. 
I'm sure that you can't go halfway through the book before you'll know through the power of the Holy Ghost that it is really true. This is what the Lord refers to as the New Covenant of the Book of Mormon. In the 84th section of the Doctrine and Covenants, he says that the Church is under condemnation because they've not kept the New Covenant. And it is that we may say to the Lord that His promises are not true. If we say that, it's purely because we haven't kept His covenant, which is to read the book on the basis that I've indicated and come to an understanding of it. And then He's obligated to give to you by covenant the answer to your prayers and to give you the assurance of the divinity of this new witness for Jesus Christ, which we proclaim to all the world. I want to tell you that I have the testimony that Jesus is the Christ. At this Christmas time, I do rejoice in the wonderful events that we commemorate, in the excitement that comes to our children, in the uplifting thrill that continues to return to me year after year, in the realization that the Savior really was born. The camels and the angels and the manger and the animals and all the rest are vivid and vital and very clear and true to me. They're not true just because I've listened to a legend. They're true because the Spirit of our Father in Heaven through the Holy Ghost has touched me and given me the testimony that this is truly the birth of His Son Jesus Christ upon the earth. To Him we are obligated to give service throughout our lives as the members of the Church of Jesus Christ. May we do so, I pray, in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.